Okay, so let us uh, understand um, RFID from a protocol perspective, right? So RFID protocol is important. You have to understand this protocol well if you want to tune some of the parameters that we have discussed during the demonstration sessions, targets, persistence time, so many things we said, right. So, uh, so in a capsule, let us quickly understand uh, protocol and the hard problems that are currently prevalent uh, in the RFID domain. One hard problem that occurs to me is related to throughput. The second hard problem is related to localization. I will say these are two hard problems. <coughs> okay. And let us spend some time understanding uh, this RFID protocol uh, uh, in the with the with the view of trying to give you an idea of how to solve these two uh, challenging problems or hard problems in the RFID domain. Okay. So, so let us see how we can um, start with this uh, throughput and move on from there. Firstly, the uh, when we talk about RFID, we are referring to EPC Gen 2, okay. EPC Gen 2 um, by and large class 1 kind of uh, protocol okay class 1 protocol epc gen 2 class 1 protocol essentially this protocol adapts um, what is known as a framed framed slotted aloha okay it's also called fsa it uses it adapts uh, FSA and binary binary tree splitting algorithms. Okay. To do what? To avoid to avoid collisions to avoid collisions to avoid collisions on the medium access control layer okay and why does this happen this happens when multiple tags multiple tags multiple tags respond respond in the same slot that is the problem okay so what happens two tags if they respond in the same time slot when i say same slot i mean the time slot okay this what will happen the data signal that arrives at the reader is a mixed mixture of both. Uh, the reader does not know how to decode and therefore has to discard both the tags, uh, the data coming from this tag because it just cannot make out everything is garbled, right. Essentially, this is loss in throughput, right. So, that is what I was trying to say which means if you have a very large tag population, if you have a very large top uh, tag population um, and you are trying to meet certain performance objectives of reading all tags within a given time that is assigned to you, uh, it is not going to how, how well does the whole system cover all the tags being read is the question because you can have tags colliding and not all tags being covered during uh, 
the time when you are reading for a given time you know you are always specifying with respect to a given time. Why is that important? Because you go into a departmental store there are millions and millions of items which are tagged no maybe uh, maybe a million items which are tagged and you are given let us say I give you uh, half an hour and you have to just give an inventory of all the items which are tagged there. Supposing some, some kind of time limit is uh, given to you, you are expected to ensure that all tags are read and within the given time frame that is given to you. So, uh, unless you have a very high performance uh, uh, algorithm, you will end up with these uh, slots uh, tags colliding um, due to uh, this and then you will have a loss in throughput. So, we must understand how the protocol works and what possibility exists for us to sort of uh, have a handle on reducing the collisions and therefore improving the throughput. So, let us put down a nice picture which will tell us about how the uh, system uh, uh, how, how throughput can be improved. So, it is essentially it is a challenge to improve the techniques uh, there are quite a few th uh, techniques. So, let us see one by one ok. I will draw a picture and uh, explain to you show you the, uh, the way the protocol actually works. So, let me quickly summarize this uh, protocol and uh, I want you to look at this picture. Here is the readers view and here is the tags view. Now, basically the reader sends out a query command uh, to all the tags and uh, the query command contains several parameters um, uh, which essentially we talks about the Miller encoding uh, parameter whether it should do Miller encoding um, 248 or whether it should do FM0 encoding and also um, the amplitude shift key, the frequency when it does an amplitude shift uh, keying the frequency that has to be required all these parameters are sent out in the query command. Now, in response to that the tags are already powered now and uh, what the tags will do is and apart from this of course, as I mentioned to you the k is also sent capital K essentially is the frame size essentially this will talk about a large number of slots which are available for the tag is uh, actually knows the number of time slots which are available uh, for sending out its uh, um, you know 96 bit id. Now, the 96 bit id essentially before it actually can go out here the 96 bit id can go out here it has to first initially send out a, a 16 bit random number and this we will call as the rn16 ok. As you can see soon after the query the rn16 goes out and if there are no collisions the reader accepts all these uh, rn16 uh, random numbers uh, from these tags and they will and it will respond with an ACK in this direction in the downlink direction. In response to the ACK, the uh, tags will actually send out their 96 bit ID because they know that they got a successful ACK which means they are not collided and then it goes back to the reader and the, and the reader in turn will uh, send back a response called the Q rep which is essentially the response. This in essence is indeed the RFID uh, protocol. Uh, uh, working between the RFID reader and the tag. Tags are all read right um, after all the tags are read the reader will power down will power down. It is very easy to write this, but difficult to ensure that all tags are actually read right. So, that is what is important. Mm, we refer to an individual frame as an inventory round and a series of inventory rounds between uh, power down periods as a inventory cycle. So, I will show you a picture which will allow you to appreciate what I am saying. I will show you circles like this, I will draw circles like this ok. I will start from here go on and put it here exactly here ok. Each one of this small circle which I have shown here is indeed called inventory 
round essentially a complete um, set of inventory rounds making up a circle this whole thing is nothing but the inventory cycle. So, once it comes to this arrow back here there is a power down. Now, it is easy to see all through these circles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 all through these 9 small circles that I have shown which we will now call inventory rounds I mentioned to you already there is power for the tag. Okay. If there is power for the tag within an inventory cycle if a tag was unsuccessful here to send out its uh, RN16 and get an ACK for its RN16 I would say not unsuccessful in sending out an RN16 but not getting an acknowledgement back for its sent out RN16 because of collision it can attempt here or if it is unsuccessful here it can attempt here. Okay. Therefore, K spans the whole of this inventory cycle this capital K that means you will have number of slots right number of slots which cover the complete inventory cycle. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 we can pull off this. right which essentially is one each individual cycle uh, in each individual round inside. So, all along from here to here there is this is power down to power down this again you will have a power down here. So, all through there is power. So, if a slot if a tag does not make it in one inventory round it can try again and again and again and again. Basically the, the dimension of uh, the size of each of these uh, circles can also be made very small right you can have very small circles and you can have very large circles. Essentially in a way you can imagine that k can be adjusted. The trouble is if you have a large k it is good for uh, tags to uh, they will keep finding an opportunity to uh, communicate successfully to the base station but the latency takes a beating latency increases for large k. So, therefore, you have to choose between a very large value of k and uh, ensure that uh, you still do a good coverage right. Even to find out what is the correct value of k is not easy and therefore, lot of work has gone behind in several uh, pieces in literature where they choose the right value of k such that collisions are uh, close to 0 at the end I mean at the end of inventory cycle and all tags would have successfully uh, and therefore, all tags would have got successfully uh, registered they with their 96 bit id. But the real challenge in this area of RFID is recovery from recovery from collisions where on the RFID reader and this essentially means that there this is a challenge to improve the throughput. Uh, I must point you to a nice paper which uh, does talk about this challenge and that paper is called I will just write the title multi packet multi packet reception multi packet reception max schemes for 
the RFID EPC Gen 2 protocol. Okay. The authors are Dan, D, D, Danny, D A N I, Danny Lo, D Dono, and others. Okay. Um, this was published in 2012 by the IEEE. Okay. So, there this paper actually will talk about how does one recover from collision, how to improve throughput and um, basically it is a nice challenge and that is what I mentioned about um, the fact that throughput improving throughput becomes an important uh, requirement for RFID systems. At least if the RFID reader is able to recover one of the two tags which are uh, collided then it is already an improvement right. So, the readers in this paper are actually talking about how to recover from um, two nodes colliding might recover at least one from that and then uh, what they do is it is interesting if you are interested you should also try. Um, you can run the RFID reader software apart from just buying commercial software you can also use RFID reader from open source open source and run it on software defined radio platforms. Uh, there is a platform called the USRP ok you can run it on USRP uh, platforms that uh, the since the uh, tags are reading the slots are picking a slot randomly randomly picked slots right um, picked slots it is important for you to note that the random number generator generator if it is a good one uh, can also reduce collisions in a way right. So, some people so there are some very standard algorithms particularly there is a generator called linear congruential congruential generator LCG. LCG is a very common uh, pseudo random number generator and this can be used ok. So, this is an important uh, thing and that is what basically the protocol is actually uh, talking about. So, the second challenge I mentioned to you which is a hard problem in the area of RFID um, is related to the uh, problem of localization. If you look carefully the demonstration that we did the other day uh, the other time um, you will see that two parameters are available to us one is received signal strength indicator RSSI and the other information that was available was related to phase. These two parameters can be effectively used to um, perform localization localization of a tag ok uh, and many many papers have appeared in literature on how they can be used. It turns out that uh, phase based approach is much superior compared to RSSI, but nevertheless RSSI also for very uh, simple applications uh, seem to be uh, already good enough for very rough uh, location estimation. Why is this an important problem at all in RFID? First you have to understand that if you take the use cases for RFID, it is used in let us say warehouses for logistics and all that. Take pharmaceutical industry ok, you dump a number of uh, uh, let us say uh, uh, drugs in a warehouse and uh, you are interested in not identifying all the drugs which are there in that, but you are interested in locating 
you are interested in locating a particular drug. Now, that information is not going to be made available to you by just reading the tag id right. It will just say the tag is present and therefore, the drug is present where it is present in a warehouse is never no going to be uh, revealed to you because there is no simple way. Therefore, how can we use RFID for localization? We already mentioned some nice things about RFID and its uh, power. Uh, just to recap again RFID can be interfaced with sensors, RFID can be used for the purposes of um, localization and uh, RFID can be read in quick time and the challenge there is to reduce collisions reduce collisions and improve throughput. So, that many many hundreds and thousands of tags can be read in quick time right and uh, there is uh, so these things are already there. So, uh, let us understand this uh, localization challenge um, of uh, in RFID but we will restrict ourselves to just the RSSI based method ok. And this is just to give you an idea of on localization rather than not rather go into the details of uh, localization algorithms ok. Just concentrate on the RSSI part. In general this RSSI is available on almost all types of radios ok. Uh, BLE Bluetooth low energy can give you RSSI, Wi-Fi can throw some information about RSSI, RFID again RSSI, cellular networks essentially the telecom networks they also give you telecom cell networks they also give you RSSI. So, there is something about this uh, receive signal strength which you can exploit and uh, try to see whether you can roughly uh, do some sort of uh, localization ok. Uh, I will also tell you that while it is possible what the limitations of RSSI are also with respect to uh, going in for superior methods which use phase as a possible signature for uh, purposes of localization. Let us start by taking a very simple picture ok essentially this, this, this and this dot here is also like this ok. <coughs> 1, 2, 3 are transmitters assume that 1, 2, 3 are 1, 2, 3 are sort of let us say um, are transmitters, but whose ok are basically are transmitters and receivers and they are basically transceivers, but importantly their location is known ok. That is important the locations of all the three are known that means they are in fixed locations they are in fixed locations alright. The fourth node let us say this node number 4 is a mobile node is a mobile node ok. This is a node number 4 which is essentially a 4 node. Now, the 2 dimensional um, so what you can do is and the goal is what the goal is to determine goal is to determine the goal is to determine uh, the estimated estimated two dimensional location of node number 4. You are interested in 4 uh, location two dimensional location uh, essentially you are talking about x and y, but well this can also be extended to 3 d and you can also get z and all that, but do not worry about it. So, just look at uh, the requirement of 2 d location of um, of 
4. Now, the location estimation uh, basically begins with 4 location estimate the first step is what should 4 do what 4 should do is it should transmit 4 should transmit transmit a signal okay it should transmit a signal with pre defined power okay transmit power is known to 1 2 and 3 remember 1 2 3 are transmitters but also receivers they can also receive the signal from 4 that is very very important now assuming that all these uh, 1 2 and 3 have omni directional antenna okay they all have omnidirectional antenna uh, fixed to um, the each one of them you can easily estimate you can now estimate you can estimate the distance distance r between between its location its location and location of node 4 with a very simple equation everything comes from the link budget equation right so pr received power is transmitted power minus 10 n of log n log 10 of f minus n log of this r plus 30 times n minus 32.44 in dBm. Do not worry so much about this equation, it simply says uh, the received power is nothing but the transmitted power P t, this is transmitted power okay. again in dBm of node 4 that is that is what we said it should transmit with a predefined power that is the predefined power P t P r is nothing but the received signal strength P r is nothing but the received signal strength R s s at the fixed node uh, location f is what the transmitted signal frequency f is the transmitted transmitted signal frequency okay in megahertz basically it is in megahertz it is in megahertz n is what path loss exponent this n is the path loss exponent each um, technology and each uh, system will have these numbers and I will not go into the detail um, basically it is uh, telling you about the distance uh, square law um, essentially uh, builds on top of the distance square law. Uh, n is the path loss exponent and r is the distance in meters okay r is this distance in meters now you can use this very effectively in the following way take node 1 okay you can estimate the distance r1 from 4 okay distance is r1 from between node 1 and 4 node 1 and 4 you is r1 Okay, this is the distance right um, using this RSS. So, you get 1 RSS like this right from the single measurement done by node 1 the only conclusion that can be made is that node 4 is located on its perimeter would you agree 
it is located on its perimeter. So, let us show it quickly. It is located on its perimeter, you can say that, right? Is what you can say. Oops. Okay, you can say I do not want to, oops, it is not a good way to keep erasing. Um, yeah, you can say that. The only conclusion that can be made is that it is on the perimeter of a circle with radius r1 um, centered at node 1. I'm, I have not shown it properly, but excuse me for that. Mm, we should show it with the center there, right? Something like this center. Now, what you can do is you can use simple Euclidean expressions, a Euclidean distance expression, Euclidean E U C L I D I A N, Euclidean distance expression, and we can write a very simple one x 1 minus x 4 the whole square plus y 1 minus y 4 the whole square is r 1 square. I hope you will appreciate that this is situated in x 1 y 1 and this is in x 4 y 4 ok that is the idea right x 4 y 4 two dimensional only we have taken. Similarly ok uh, you can uh, take this r 1 square on the left hand side and make this equal to 0 and all of that um, you can take that and make it equal to 0. Um, you can derive other equations also you can derive for x 2 y 2 and for x 3 y 3 you will get r 1 r 2 and r 3 right r 1 square r 2 square and r 3 square you can put them down in a nice matrix representation of a x equal to b and that is quite simple x 1 minus x 4 whole square plus y 1 minus y 4 um, the whole square x 2 minus same x 4 right y 2 minus y 4 the whole square x 3 minus x 4 whole square plus y 3 minus y 4 whole square right. minus r 1 square r 2 square r 3 square equal to 0 correct. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, in the ideal scenario uh, which is um, what we are saying um, you should be able to uh, you will get. So, the basically there will be a pair of coordinates x 4 y 4 uh, that satisfies this equation. So, there will be a pair right that satisfies this equation. So, I will write that down there will be a pair x 4 y 4 pair of coordinates. that 
satisfies this equation and that is all that you need to know you need to do. If it satisfies this equation that value x y x 4 y 4 is the location of the node 4 that is all ok. And uh, this method of determining the relative location of nodes this method is actually called tri lateration. trilateration. The trouble is uh, you know you will never get uh, x 4 y 4 very accurately ok. The problem is it fluctuates. So, it is very hard using RSSI methods to actually fix on what is x 4 y 4 and that is indeed the biggest limitation of RSSI ok. There are other, uh, so it impacts the accuracy, it impacts the estimated distance. The estimated distance uh, is impacted, the estimated distance is impacted because of the fact that uh, there is a lot of inaccuracy in the measurement of RSSI as provided by these systems. So, you cannot even believe that indeed that um, the RSSI that it reads is exactly uh, what it should because uh, then your equation this, uh, this satisfying this equation becomes difficult. So, what normally you would say is there is a certain error associated with the range estimation error is there range estimation uh, error which is. Uh, uh, which is uh, range estimation error. What are we trying to uh, ultimately lead you to? What we are saying is because of reflections, because of reflections um, in the in metallic mediums. wherever you have positioned the reader tag environment all of that does not give you a stable RSSI reading at all. You will never get a stable RSSI value and if you do not get stable value there is no way of fixing satisfying this equation and there is going to be an error ok. So, practically use of RSSI is difficult. Okay, that is one thing. Another reason why okay, then let me just finish this. So, that is uh, one part why RSSI is hard, but then there are ways by which. So, what you normally do is you do not uh, really say that it is equal to it satisfies this condition equal to 0, but you could perhaps say that it satisfies some error E 1 square, E 2 square and E 3 square. You do not make it 0 but you say it satisfies some E 1 square, E 2 square and E 3 square error in the measurement from each one of the nodes. And what you do is you try and do uh, some square basically this E 1 square, E 2 square, E 3 square is nothing but the square error, square error which is nothing but E 1 square plus E 2 square plus E 3 square. And then you say uh, the goal is location estimation um, that it minimizes this error square error. Now, you modify the goal, goal is modified and now you go ahead and say I will because I have a problem with this RSSI in its measurement accuracy because of several reasons. I will now modify the goal and the new goal now becomes. Um, estimating estimation uh, the, the to find this x 4 y 4 that minimizes to find x 4 y 4 that minimizes that minimizes the square error. This is all you can do you can never get it to 0 
that is the point ok. <coughs> I must point you to uh, some other reasons um, why RSSI is not a good idea, why RSSI is not a good idea. It is because you can have um, you can have because these are all I would say low cost, uh, low cost and cheap, um, low cost and cheap hardware because they are co low cost and cheap hardware you can have hardware errors ok and these hardware errors can read different RSSIs on different uh, tags you can have different RSSI, so RSSI can be because of that um, ok. Another thing is antenna, antenna what did you assume? You assume that it is a, so look at the radiation pattern and go back to what we said right. How are you sure what is the polarization of the antenna? You would expect good tag reads, you would expect maximum number of tag reads if the antenna pattern radiation pattern is circular, circular radiation, circular uh, polarization sorry, circular polarization, po circular polarization means you will get maximum number of successful tag reads maximum number of successful tag reads. Here with respect to RSSI this is not the challenge, the challenge is ok you will get a lot of tag reads, but each of the value each of the time you read the RSSI each time you read the tag the corresponding RSSI is fluctuating that is indeed the challenge ok. So, and, and uh, various reasons why that is an issue ok and um, radiation pattern you can never assume that the radiation pattern indeed is uh, omnidirectional you can never um, uh, never make an assumption about that. How are you sure? Maybe it has a lobe which is uh, extending quite a bit in one direction, but in the other direction the lobe perhaps is not extending too much then uh, in which case it can have uh, issues related to uh, reading uh, RSSI accurately ok. Um, that is one thing then uh, so I mentioned about omnidirectional so radiation pattern. So, radiation pattern affects the uh, signal strength and therefore, will affect the RSSI alright. Then <coughs> So, what is the way out some if, if you keep asking this question what is the way out? Uh, the way out is um, get as many RSSI readings as possible read as much as many RSSI readings maximum RSSI readings as possible and then you take so, you increase over a long period do multiple times somehow you reduce the error by repeating the experiments by reading it for long durations of time and then observing some pattern and then somehow you reduce the error um, ok. So, that might be one way of uh, of let us say using still continuing to use RSSI for the purpose of uh, localization ok. Then there are other ways uh, there are uh, um, other theoretical approaches theoretical approaches and uh, very popularly is something called ray tracing. ray tracing methods uh, 
by which um, you estimate the um, uh, the indoor environment floor plan uh, reflection coefficients of surrounding materials and you use as much as other information as possible and um, use that put that use all of that and then arrive at some way of uh, uh, fixing the RSSI value. So, this is in brief uh, what you can do with respect to RSSI. Finally, uh, you also should know that phase appears appears to be uh, good signature available from most RFID readers for the purpose of purpose of uh, tag localization. Let me show you a picture of what we mean by phase of the tag and uh, with that we will understand a little better about how to extract this phase from the uh, how to how to use the sorry the phase is already available from the reader every time it reads the tag but how to use that phase in a manner that you will be able to use it for localization. So, we said phase appears to be a good signature for purpose of tag localization um, let us see that here in this picture what I have done I have uh, shown you a reader this is the RFID reader this is the tag this is the tag on this side this is the tag okay, and this is the reader they are separated by some distance r okay. and uh, a wave which travels from the transmitter antenna RFID reader antenna goes all the way up to the travels dist distance r and gets back scattered to another distance r right. So, 2 r is the total distance travelled by the wave. I have shown this dotted line to indicate that this is really back scatter this is important tag is back scattering the data right because it does not have a battery. By the way when you say battery I keep saying this uh, there are basically three types of tags right there are something called active tags there are uh, passive tags and there are battery assisted passive tags. These essentially have batteries and uh, uh, they are another class of RFID tags. Please look them up carefully uh, to understand um, how these tags are different. So, I am just saying that there are three different types of tags. So, just keep note of that. So, here in this case what I have taken is a completely passive tag and it is doing a backscatter of the information. Okay, very good. Um, as you know this is lambda. Lambda is simply given by C by F. C is the velocity of light. F is the frequency of operation and this is the lambda. right? So, um, essentially the total phase theta is nothing but 2 pi times this 2 r by lambda plus q t q r and theta tag sorry not q I mean theta t theta r and theta tag. <coughs> what I mean by this theta t r and uh, this theta is nothing but the uh, phase rotation phase rotation when doing a transmission gives you theta t when you are receiving you get theta r and the tag itself will have a uh, theta tag as a phase rotation. Okay. Theta t and theta r will manifest themselves at the reader side whereas, theta tag will manifest from the tag side. Now, why the good thing about phase based localization is the phase itself is, peri is a periodic function with period 2 pi uh, radians. And the phase values of course, will repeat uh, at uh, distances um, separated by integer multiples of one half the carrier wavelength, but that is ok. Uh, but you will be able to because the fact that this is a periodic function it is a lot more stable for you to do localization to complete localization 
with uh, face and uh, uh, I would point you again to papers such as back pass and 3 D INSAR which essentially build on uh, use of uh, the uh, phase based approach and uh, do look and uh, perform localization using uh, and and uh, come to very accurate uh, localization of, of RFID tags. You can have uh, um, you can have mechanisms where uh, you can use single antenna or you can use multiple antenna. When you go to the multiple antenna case it is quite simple quite similar to RSSI where we showed three nodes receiver nodes and one and you are trying to fix the location of the fourth node. It is very similar right you basically use multiple antenna and uh, you try to get the phase information from this multiple antenna and then you do a trilateration equivalent um, and uh, use simple geometrical techniques and you do um, you can you and basically you can do a phase you can look at the you can look you can localize the tag using uh, phase. Another approach is you can use a single antenna and try uh, also localization. So, these papers essentially are uh, very uh, are recently published articles where they discuss about the localization of RFID tags using uh, phase based approach. It is a very rich area of uh, problems and uh, exciting solutions are available for people to look up when they uh, when they use uh, phase and in fact very stable loca uh, localizations are possible. In fact uh, back pause says that it can localize a tag to an accuracy of 12.5 centimeters which is uh, pretty good um, for uh, many applications. So, that is broadly what the uh, localization challenge uh, with the RFID tags are all about.